your guides to a really great financial future. Tom and Don are talking real money. Well, look at this. Look at us. It's another exciting edition of Talking Real Money slash Sound Investing, the podcast and video cast, all purpose cast, all for you. And I'm Don McDonald, and I am always thrilled to uh, spend some time with good friends, Paul mm. Merriman. Oh, hey, good Merriman. to be here, but I just realized I don't yeah. have the spotlight on me here. Got to have that spotlight. Oh, Wait yeah. No, he's got to have... Is, oh, is now it, I look so oh, good. Oh, yeah, yeah. There we yeah, go. Yeah. And then you need a little gobo in the background with a little scenic thing going. Uh, and, much younger now, though. And then over here, over here on this other screen is uh, my good friend Tom Cock from the Vestry offices in in Seattle, Bellevue. Hello. Yeah, yeah. And I'm glad to see in retirement that you and I, we're not in retirement. Paul is. He can't afford headphones. We're still working. We can apparently afford to buy them. No, so I, I left them. Kind of I left them in Oregon. I'm sorry. I'll, oh, I'll, if I had a nickel for every time, oh. anyway. <laughs> left them. All in right. Oregon. Hi, everybody. Um, we talk about money on this because you'd think so. Talking real money and sound investing; those are all money-oriented words. And uh, one of the big money issues that we like to discuss is investing, and one of the biggest areas in which everybody on the planet now invests, is the stock market. Stocks, individual stocks. Now, before we go any further into this, we just really, I want real quickly to give all the the newbies a bit of a primer on what we talk about when we're talking about stocks and the stock market, Tom. You're asking me or you're telling me? Um, I'm, I'm, we're, I'm telling you to tell us. <laughs> we're asking oh, you to, I, to explain. By the way, he gave me what no warning stocks? that this was coming. Um Stocks I'm happy to are, help you, Tom, if you can't figure it out. <laughs> investment in companies. All right. This is this is not working out. We're just going to stop because Tom doesn't know his... <laughs> investment in companies. If it's not scripted, he's in trouble. I think what he's getting to is, though, that when we say stocks, oftentimes people think we're saying go decide whether to buy a stock, which yeah, and, one and at the, the time stock, or I mean, yeah. it's, ownership, it's ownership of companies. Correct. And therefore, it's been... Um, a, a, a way to make it has in the past, Paul, made decent money. Well, yeah, I mean, we they the academics have gone back and pulled out the pricing of every stock that's been public going back to the 20s, 1920s, and uh, the S and P 500 has grown as a as an index as a group at about 10 percent a year. Now that's the good news. The bad news is about half of the companies that were public didn't do well. As a matter of fact, they didn't make any money. Many went bankrupt, and many, by the time that the, the stock went away, they had not made any real money for the public. But the other half made it all worthwhile, which, is, by the way, one of the reasons we don't want people trying to pick individual stocks is one at a time they are really very risky. But as a group, historically, they are not. Short-term, yes, always as a group. But long-term, not. Well, but but as a group, though, that group over the past 90 years or however many years, well, I guess the S&P is since the 70s. But over that period, that group of stocks has changed dramatically. Different companies come and go and move in and out and every which way. And yet it still makes money, Tom? It has. Um, and by the way, Paul, why don't we just only buy the 50% that go up? I don't want to own the other ones. I mean, what's the point well, of all that? It's even better. That's what than makes that, us Tom. so much fun to watch. Yeah, it's better than that. If It's 4% of the companies, one out of 25, are the ones that have really driven the return. The other 96% have averaged about 3%. So, All right. uh, uh, Paul, Paul, what, which, which are those stocks going it's, it's forward? It's Tesla in the That's last the ten sp- years. I know that much. <laughs> no, no, I need to know. Go, I don't care about well, past. I oh, want to know what the going next, forward. The next. Let me tell you. I'm taking notes. Go ahead. I'm going to make it easy for you because I can look backwards and see one of the most profitable companies ever was General yeah. Motors. So you got to have General Motors in your portfolio. Ouch. Oh, wait, didn't they go bankrupt? That didn't work out. <laughs> yeah, they well. did. You see, that's the problem. Sears Roebuck, another big winner. Hmm. 
Well, that's no good. Enron, you've World not helped. Com, you've, Washington you've Mutual. You've been of no help whatsoever. Well, can we you've, recover somehow you've, from this? All right, let's disaster. recover somehow. Because if we're talking about stocks, we're saying stocks have in the past made money and good money. Why don't I just buy some really good stocks and hang on to them? Well, we're talking about managing risk. And what we know is the expected rate of return of any single individual large cap growth company is the same rate of return as all of those large companies. Now, of course, some will do better, but some will do worse. And we don't know ahead of time. And so the beauty is in owning the whole, the index, all of those stocks, it gives you a chance to get that market return without the risk of putting all your money in Enron, which if you've forgotten, a lot of people did and lost it all. Yeah. Then there was that one Tom loves to talk about. What was the name of that one? It was a rather large Washington trust bank based Mutual. here in Seattle. Yeah. Ah, that one. Yeah. Washington Well, Mutual? then Tom, okay. Paul's, if Paul is correct, which I think he is, I've looked at the numbers. So the index, you own the index, you just kind of get the, the whole thing and it's been a pretty good number. Why don't I just own the S&P 500 in, and as be opposed done with to be a global as portfolio? Or, or S&P or 500. Or, or, or owning those stupid bonds ah, or gold. Now let's get or, to the, we're getting to the gist of the matter here because, yeah, if, if it's all about just making money over the long haul, you've made far more being in stocks than in bonds. I, and you can correct me, Paul, if I'm wrong here, but I think stocks, as you said, are about 10. Bonds over the long haul have been somewhere between four and five, still better than right. – other asset classes, but not nearly as good. You're correct. And by the way, when people ask me, I say, that's fine. But let me give you my reasons that I don't think that's a good idea over the long haul, right? Okay. First of all, you, if you're going to have it all in stocks, need to be prepared for a loss along the way of about 50% of your portfolio. And most people, they can't take that sort of the day to day down, 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 down. They're going to bail out. They're going to move to bonds. They're going to move to cash. They're going to do something. So that's number one. Number two, here's one I, I just thought of last night. Bonds, because they truly are an IOU, right? There's there's an obligation there that you don't get with stocks. That's a different type of security than stocks. So you're really diversifying if you own stocks and bonds between different types of securities there that I think could, could help you. Um, so it's diversification. And by the way, Paul knows this well. There are periods of time when bonds actually out, do outperform stocks. I think last March, there were people saying, hey, look back over the last like 10 or 12 years, bonds have done better than stocks. It was mm -hmm. a short window after stocks had gone down dramatically last spring. But there are periods of time where they, they, they've outperformed. But here's the reason I think anyone near or close to retirement should own them. They should provide a stable base to draw from when you're in retirement, a, a, a pool of money, if you will, while the stocks are doing this, da, 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 up and down and up and down and up and down, maybe down after you retire. And so then you have the stable pool that you can draw from without worrying about really pulling, you're drawing too much from things that have gone down recently. So, so the humble. argument is to have more diversification. I think it is. I think it's it's security diversification. By the way, we also recommend, as you know, using real estate investment trusts, which have slightly different characteristics than both stocks and bonds. Um, well, so, then, yeah, Paul, here what about gold and out. Bitcoin? Then? <laughs> gold uh, well, Bitcoin. if we're diversifying, why aren't we buying precious metals in like uh, <laughs> cryptocurrencies and stuff? Well, there, there, there still is a desire to find investments that have a long history of success. And for what it's worth, gold historically has been very volatile, but has a long-term return that is actually lower than a long-term government bond. So uh, high risk and, and relatively low returns, not, not, not a good idea. I do think that young people, when they hear that one thing makes 5% and another makes 10%, they may think that the outcome is you're going to make about twice as much over time with the stocks than the bonds. But when you multiply that and compound that over the years, if, if, if you put 
uh, money into every every year you put six thousand dollars into bonds, and that's all you did for forty years, and then you lived off of it, and then you died and you left some money to other people. By the time you add all that up, it's about two million dollars. Do the same thing with stocks. It's about $22 million. Wow. So it's 10 okay. times over time. So you just young people, please take, I just wrote an article and did a podcast uh, on this. For young people, stocks are the way for the long term. Short-term volatility, the payoff for taking that short-term risk is huge. Yes, but as Tom mentioned, that short-term volatility, <clears throat> excuse me, can be as much as or has been in the past, realistically, as much as half your money. I would yeah. be willing to bet there are a lot of young people out there who are going to freak out, just like old people, when their portfolio declines by half. They need to be educated, Don. They need to understand that when you're young, and you're putting money dollar cost averaging on a regular basis into a 401k, those declines are great because you have a chance to buy more shares of stocks that will eventually, from everything we know about the past, be at higher prices. So what sounds like a really scary thing for a young person is truly an advantage. So you're saying they need to put aside their ageist attitude, and listen to old people like us. You know, that's what it boils down to. But what if I gave you a number? What if I gave you uh, a number? I knew you'd have a number. Paul, I've got a the, number. Do you have a Just number? Imagine that. 50, $50 a month into yeah. the S&P 500. Now, that's a very high quality stock company index. $50 a month for 40 years. At that 10%, and 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 then just let it ride. In fact, let it ride for the rest of your life. There are a lot of people who have done wonderfully for staying a committed to a for a portion of their portfolio, all stocks all the time for a portion of that portfolio. But you're talking about the potential uh, of around four million dollars uh, over a long period of time. Yep. Can I, can, can I, here, here's what I need then from you. I need that 40 years. Just give me the yeah. 40 years and I will do that. Can uh, you, you know, you that? the good news is there are a lot of people listening to this that have it. The That's bad news true. is I'm not one of them. And I don't know about you guys. <laughs> that is the problem. That is what young people have. That is the asset. That is the leverage that makes you so special. And if you blow it and you miss that opportunity to let that that compounding work for you, it's it's a life changer. And it's just a matter of trusting the long term. Not everybody does. And let's take, now, what let's about take up having, age. Having you, other things, though, Tom. Yeah, well, you, mean, you, you mentioned age. I think this is a very important point you've just raised here. Young people, yeah, heavily in stocks. They got to know if they can take the pain. That's important. But when you get, I think, to about 50. That's when you should start thinking about retirement. That's when you should have a plan for what your retirement income is going to look like. And that's when I meet with a lot of people who still have very equity heavy portfolios when they don't need to. My argument against that always is what is your goal, your purpose with the money? You're never going to be the richest person in the world because there's a guy named Jeff Bezos that last week, even after the divorce, was worth $214 billion with a B. Dollars. It's a lot of money. So set that aside. Then in my world, it's how much money you need to grow, grow it to sustain your lifestyle. And then if you're lucky, you leave something to others. But really, it is about that. So then you get into the, as I said before, this trade off between return and stability, or as you would say, risk aversion. That, I think, for people after 50 is very, very important. Yes, for young people, pile it all into stocks. Hopefully do it in Roths, for example. I just met with a, a, a young man yesterday who's, even though he's in a fairly high tax bracket, is putting his whole 401k and his wife's 401k into Roth 401k, all in stocks. Boom. He's going to have a home run, I think, here in about 30 years. He'll have to stick out some tough markets, as you point out. But yeah, for I think there is that 
kind of that dividing line between 50 and 60 when you really do start thinking about risk aversion rather than just making as much as you possibly can. Well, we talked a lot about the S&P 500, but isn't that still too limiting, Paul? Particularly for younger people. You, you know, that for some people, absolutely. As a matter of fact, I would want them to add some small cap value to the portfolio. Uh, in this study that we just did, we used only the S&P 500 because it's something people have a sense of trust about. And, and, uh, uh, and by the way, I did make a mistake. I said $50 a month would take you to $4 million. That assumed they were working at a company that matched that fifty dollars oh, a month. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm coming clean. I'm coming so clean. So it's a hundred dollars for the a match. It's a hundred dollars a month to end up with four. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but but you know the 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 bottom line is that we want people to get started as soon as and early as they can, and we don't, particularly with the inexperienced. If you stick with the S and P five hundred, the beauty is. You'll see the list of the top 50 companies and you'll say, ah, yeah, those are companies. There's, uh, uh, there's Microsoft and there's all of the Amazons and the Facebooks and, and a lot of other big uh, oil companies and drug companies, the giants, the giants. And yet even those giants make a phenomenal long-term return. Well, then, Tom, to, to kind of end this, the thought about owning all stocks in your portfolio like everything else, there's not an absolute answer. There are times when you should own all stocks in your portfolio and other times when you shouldn't. That's basically the answer. It depends. It does depend. It depends both on in terms of how long until you need the money. It depends on your emotional makeup about money because you don't want to have an all stock portfolio and then find out you can't take the pain of it going down by 30 or 40 percent. Um, so that's an aspect of it. And then, as I said, really for people, those really old people like us in their 60s, uh, and older, it really should be about your plan <laughs> because you. You your plan so nice dictates that. I know because I, I bring yeah. him back into the group. <laughs> uh, it's about the plan and it's about how much you need to make in my mind, rather than how much you want to make. We all want to make more, but when you get a little older, sometimes it's more about keeping that money rather than shooting for the moon. I'll put it that way. And we're going to continue to try to help you both make more and keep more on this and future podcasts. We also invite you to listen to both of our podcasts. Paul's is called Sound Investing. Mm -hmm. Ours is called Talking Real Money. They're on all your favorite podcast services. If you want more information on the things that we do and our teachings, go to TalkingRealMoney.com. For Paul's Nonprofit Educational Foundation, you just need to go to paulmerriman.com. And there, I believe you can even get a free copy of his book. Absolutely. We're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. Absolutely free. Such a deal. Great read. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Have a great week <laughs> or end or whatever. Thank you all for enjoying our, our little get together. We hope you enjoyed it. And again, keep watching, keep listening. And uh, we're just hanging out here talking about money with you. Thanks for being there. We hope you realize that the information provided on Talking Real Money is for educational and hopefully enjoyable purposes only. Providing personalized financial planning or investing advice takes time, so please consult with a really good fee-only fiduciary investment, tax, or legal advisor. We know a good one. Investing must always involve risk. In other words, you can and probably will lose money at times. Also, as much as you want it, no one can accurately, consistently predict the future. So past performance doesn't tell you a darn thing about what the future will bring. Unlike many other programs that say something similar, Talking Real Money is not trying to get you to buy or sell any financial products or securities. Instead, the program is provided as a public service by Vestry, a fee-only registered investment advisor. Thanks for listening, and please visit TalkingRealMoney.com for more information and disclosures. Are we done now?